very brief uh, last one. I know some of the <clears throat> see some of the folks out here with, uh, uh, that were here last time. We need a, a security specific uh, presentation. Um, my my job as the chief security officer of the organization puts me in a rare position that I'm have really been privileged to hold here. Um, I, I get to work with pretty much every single one of our compliance and security clients that comes through the door, often, frankly, before they come through the door. Um, and it's easy to tell in that first, sometimes pre-contract conversation where they are and having adopted practices around that. Um, the folks that you're gonna hear from in about a minute and a half uh, are, are one of those uh, <laughs> clients that uh, is it's kind of, it's one of the perfect fits for us. Um, I, I, again, have had the privilege of working with many already in the last few years that I've been here. Um, but Marquis Consonis was ready, willing, and had the uh, commitment to move forward on that adoption continuum. Um, they were very clear about what they needed to do. They had incredibly compelling reasons about why they needed to get into a compliant environment, why there were pieces they needed to hand off and no longer worry about. Um, what it meant to their business growth, their roadmap, um, to their ability to expand and sell and serve their clients who are um, a very, very extraordinary group of people that they serve here and across the country. You're going to hear more about that story from Anthony and John. We will be forcing John to speak, and I would encourage all of you to please ask John Baker, their CTO, who's standing against the wall, as many questions as you can. <laughs> Technical questions. No, no. Yeah, yeah. John's technical but also very philosophical. Don't, don't let his title um, mislead you. So uh, I, I will introduce him formally in a moment, but I, I do want to say this. Um, part of the privilege, again, of doing this job is um, both, both from a security and compliance perspective, but also others. I get asked questions constantly in this role, and there are folks in this room, Trey, you're one of them. Um, Adam, you are one of them. There are others here. Andrew in the back is one of them where I have fielded questions sometimes unsuspectingly um, that have made us a better organization. They've made us better in our own info security practices. Um, they've made us better from a technical perspective. They've made, made us better from a social engineering perspective. So every day as an organization, we're listening and we're growing. We are in constant continuous improvement. Um, and I just want to say thank you to the folks that are here. Um, many of you return um, all the time to see and support and grow with us. And so I just want to say thank you and acknowledge that you're always making us better as well. Um, and a very special thank you to our clients that are here to talk tonight. Uh, Anthony is the Director of Consulting Services, is going to show you some incredible work that they are doing for Consonus. Um, and John Baker, who is, again, the CTO for Marquee, also here, both amazing partners, and they will both speak to you about the work that they are doing as partners with us. So um, we might want to just turn the front yep. light off, if that's okay. And Anthony, I'll hand it to you. Great. Thank you. So um, as she said, I'm Anthony Laughlin, and I am the Director of Consulting and Data Analytics for Consonus. This is my cohort, who is a bit of a mute. John Baker. <laughs> Talk as little as possible. This is not mine. <laughs> John, John is our CTO and a phenomenal partner. And what I want to share with you guys is a little background about our organization so you get a kind of an understanding of who we are and the clients that we serve. And then I want to walk you through a process that took about five years to get to the point where we decided that we needed to be in partnership with Atmosera. So, high level, we work for two companies, John and I do. So, we work for Consonus and we work for Marquee. Consonus has three divisions. The first one is our consulting division. Um, if you were in a, the long-term care industry, you would know this brand name. If you went to a trade show, you would likely see someone from my team teaching and educating from the stage. Uh, we do a ton of consulting in mock surveys, documentation, wound care protocols, and of course we have a data analytics department. So we work across the entire nation. We also have a pharmacy division. So there are actual long-term care pharmacies out in the world. Uh, many of us are used to the Rite Aid and Walgreens of the world. What we do is actually package medications and take them to senior care nursing facilities so that the residents living in the campuses have medications. And we have four offices, a massive operation up in Seattle, one here in Portland, one in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we just opened our fourth one down in Nevada in Las Vegas. Uh, today we are the fifth largest privately held pharmacy in the United States. And we're servicing medication deliveries to about 190,000 seniors every month. So it's, it's a pretty healthy amount. 
The third division is rehab. If you ever get the opportunity to go into a skilled nursing facility and you go down to the rehab gym, there is a high probability that the people working in the gym are not employees of the nursing home. They're likely contract labor. And so that's what our team does here. We work in 10 different states. We have about 120 accounts. And the last numbers I saw, uh, we're employing about 1,000 licensed professionals, PTs, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech therapists. But I really want to direct you guys to the other company. So in addition to serving long-term care buildings, we also own some. So Marquis uh, grew up here in Morgan. Our owner is a fourth-generation leader. His great-great-great-grandmother started long-term care in Oregon, literally. I'm not kidding. And so this organization has 26 facilities. Predominantly, they are skilled nursing. We have a couple of memory care units and assisted living facilities. We also have a very large home health presence here in Oregon. And I want to start with this group because about four years ago, I'm sitting in a meeting with a very large health plan. And I'm not going to say who because you would all know who it is. And at one side of the table is myself and our CEO. I've got the uh, director of all clinical. I've got a couple of people from operations. And we were excited to be at the meeting because we have been doing some very innovative things at Marquis. We've been developing protocols specific to certain diseases. We have begun to manage readmissions, and I'll touch on what a readmission is in a second. We've been doing some things that would really align our operations, not only with hospitals, but with managed care payers. So when we were invited to this discussion, we were all pumped. On the other side of the table, there were folks from contracting. There was the medical director for the health plan, and the CFO was there. They started the meeting by saying, we don't understand the need to have all of this time spent in a nursing home. We think there's way too much utilization. We think the patient should be leaving your setting quicker and going home. We think that you guys are not doing a good job. And at one point, somebody made the comment that they thought that nursing homes were a commodity. Anybody can do it, they're all the same. This is a little shocking. They then put onto the screen a giant chart. And the chart said that the, the aggregated total of all readmission rates for our nursing homes was 27.5%. I still get angry when I, when I read this, because it was very frustrating. And it was frustrating because we had not done a good job of quantifying our value to the health plan. We naively thought that if you know you just show up and you and you you know smile a lot, maybe they'll pay you more. If you think a health plan is going to pay you more just because they want to, that's not going to happen. And we had done a poor job of quantifying our value and reiterating it and creating a platform where we could be very transparent with the health plan and with the hospital systems. And so we realized when we left this meeting that the world was shifting. Our arena was moving away from a fee-for-service model where we deliver care and we get paid for every day we do it to a world where we'll be reimbursed based on our performance metrics. How well do we manage length of stay? How well do we do it keeping a patient from going back to the hospital? All these sorts of metrics. And it was already starting to evolve. And what frightened me as the data analyst was the data that hospital and that health plan was using was claims data. It was 18 months old. They had a snapshot in time that, frankly, I found out later, they didn't even know how to calculate a readmission, so their numbers were way off. But the information they were using was not live. It was not actionable. And we realized that we wanted to work toward a point where we could get our hands on live data. And we knew that the live data was in our electronic health record. We then flew to Toronto, and we met with the folks that own our electronic health record, and we made a very compelling case as to why they need to export all the data. We'll keep using your software, but we want an hourly download. We want it sent to our servers at Consana so that we can do analytics around it. It took a little while, but we were able to pull it off. And we began to start to see actionable insights. Instead of waiting for a report that said we were doing a bad job, we could see things happening in real time. And we could alert nursing staff to effect change immediately. And as we did this, we became more accountable, and we took the results back to health systems and managed care payers, and we began to capture a lot more market share. Today, Marquee probably has the lion's share of market in Portland. And we took the same approach to all of our Consanas clients. So if you think about that map, where all of our clients work. So I spend a lot of my time in Chicago, Detroit, Baltimore, helping customers do the same thing that we've done about four years ago. So to get ready for this, we wanted to make sure that whatever analytics we were doing directly addressed these pay-for-performance areas. So a readmission, let's start with that. A readmission basically means, and here's a great anecdote for you. It's the first of the month. I'm on a conference call. 
I'm listening to a lady working for a very large health system or a hospital system in Chicago. She has about 45 nursing homes on the call. And she says, okay, nursing home A, how many patients did we send you last month? How many did you send back? And I could see her saying numerator, denominator, calculating a readmission rate. CMS defines a readmission as an admission to a hospital within 30 days of a discharge from the same or other hospital. You have to wait 30 days. She didn't get that. She was trying to calculate the readmission rate for the month that just finished. What we were able to do with our live data is tag all of the patients and then track them day by day to see who did and did not readmit. And we could do it in real time. We could do it in real time and we could filter it. I could go back to the health plan now and say, this is our overall readmission rate. This is the readmission rate for your patients, for your patients with a stroke or a hip replacement or this or this or this. So we got the ability to be very granular and hold ourselves extremely accountable. The other thing we had to do was confront an issue that I kept running into in the Midwest. I'm in Chicago again, and uh, there's a, a new entity that's emerged in long-term care. It's called the convener. And what conveners basically do is they are, think of them as mini health plans. They go in and they tell hospital systems, hey, we know you know nothing about post-acute care. We're going to manage it for you, and we'll share in the savings. And the way they share in savings is they then pull in all the nursing homes, and it was a group about this size, and the speaker told everybody in the audience, all the nursing home owners and operators, this is what you normally achieve for a length of stay, normally 20 days, 30 days, 40 days. We're going to cut it in half. We're not going to describe why this is appropriate. We're not going to concern ourselves with the medical implications of sending grandma home a little faster than you would like. And we're not even going to take the liability. So if grandma leaves and she passes away, it's on your shoulders. And then anybody who didn't want to participate was thrown out of the network. And what happened in the wake of that decision was they saved a ton of money, but readmission rates went through the roof. Mortality rates shot way up. Lawsuits went through the roof. And we had to go back and find a way to say, you know, we should be less concerned with length of stay and more concerned with the functional improvement of the resident. Let's prove that they are ready to go home. Why don't we find a way to quantify that? Luckily, a member of our team made her way onto a national committee with CMS. And so she began to see the evolution and the design of something called the care item set. What the care item set basically does is it finds a universal way to quantify that on day one, the patient is needing a lot of help, but on day 12, they're doing a lot better. And on day 17, they've stabilized and they're probably ready to go home. Now they rolled this out this year in the post-acute setting, so we're already doing this, but we at Consana started doing this four years ago. So I started collecting data. Our therapy teams would go out and say, okay, on a scale of one to six, how well is the, the patient doing in terms of eating, oral hygiene? And if you think about it, the self-care score could run from eight to 48 points. If you got an eight, you're very dependent. If you have a 48, you're ready to go home. You're fully functional. We also had mobility scores. There are 14 elements here, same scale, same you know, quantifiable data. So 14 means you need a lot of help, 84, you're ready to go home. The point being, we wanted to go back to these health plans and these conveners and say, guys, we can pull any diagnoses that we've been treating for the last year, we can track and trend functional improvement scores, and I can tell you when the patient stabilizes. And CMS is really excited about this because they want to work toward a point where they can predetermine the average length of stay for a patient in the hospital, in home health, in the acute setting or in the post-acute setting. And they can do it by primary diagnoses. They'll factor in the age. They'll even look at the socioeconomic impacts of the zip code you live in. Because people living in Palm Springs probably have more resources at home than I do. Um, the, other quantity, the other thing we want to quantify, and I don't have enough time to get into this, there are a number of quality measures. If, has anybody, show of hands, has anybody ever been to a nursing home or have a family member in a facility? Did you do any type of research? Did you go to Nursing Home Compare? You guys ever heard of this website? The government actually publishes quality measures for all nursing homes. It's not live data. It's very dated. It's skewed in the way that they mathematically calculate things. But these are quality measures. There's about 80 of them that we also want to get our hands on and see how we're impacting change in real time. And then the last thing, sadly, I would have loved to put this at the top of the list, but eventually CMS is going to begin looking at customer satisfaction. So we found ways to quantify all of this using live data. And this is where our journey to Atmosphere came. So we went out and we did this for Marquee. Marquee has one electronic health record partner. Our Consana's clients don't all use the same software. 
So I went on a very long and arduous task of meeting with every major electronic health record vendor in the United States and got permission to aggregate live data out of their system and into this environment. Now, we cowboys were doing this in our office over here in Portland, and we realized we needed her. We need her <laughs> right away. Because if you think about this, we're pulling live data in from all these EHRs, our therapy, our pharmacy. We even started pulling in CMS claims data. I'm not a fan of it, but it does help me to do some kind of really cool analytics. We even started partnering with hospitals. So now we have hospital data in there. So we definitely needed to find a way to meet compliance standards. And you know, John and I realized that before we start building any of the reporting, we need to get the platform into a world that meets HIPAA guidelines. And then John astutely said, well, wait a minute. What is the likelihood that the government is going to increase the pain threshold or the requirements for security? And we did some research on it and we realized it's probably going to move toward the banking industry. And so luckily we came across Brian and Leslie and we were able to learn about Atmosfera. And so today, this whole program I'm about to show you lives here. What we've done is we've segmented all the reporting, we've broken it down so you can see live performance metrics in real time, anytime you want to look at them. We also have that claims data so that if I want to historically look back and see if I'm taking market share away from my competitors, I can do that. So as a user, I can go in and look at live functional improvement scoring, readmission rates, quality measures, we even partnered with a group that surveys every patient that leaves our setting and we get customer satisfaction scores on everybody. And we can cross-correlate all of that data. On the other side of the fence, we develop tools so that our facility partners can take a report card that has all of this data to a hospital system or a payer or even a doctor. We can track and trend census. When census starts to dip down, we can send an alert that says, hey, by the way, Providence Health System is not sending you as many patients this week as you got last week. It's that kind of detailed analytics. And we can track the, track the historical discharge patterns from a hospital. I can drop a pin on any hospital in the US and I can tell you who the doctors were that were treating the patients, what the diagnoses were, what the cost was to the system, how much money we're able to save in Baltimore versus Detroit. It's really cool data. I geek out about this stuff. <laughs> so this is an example. And this is all of our marquee buildings. And this is a report. We go in every quarter. We put this kind of information on the screen. We bring all the administrators in for all the buildings. And we start saying, all right, why are you guys so high? And what are you doing well? And we quartile the data so we can see who's underperforming and overperforming. And I'll tell you, you know, anecdotally, if I look at this, these two buildings that have very high readmission rates, that makes sense to me. They're both in Las Vegas. They both specialize in treating patients that are on a vent. So they're going to have a very high readmission rate. And so we're comfortable with that. It's these other ones. We're always constantly trying to move this group this way and move everybody down into the single digits, which is a very difficult thing to do. One of the things we wanted the program to do is give us the ability to do root cause analysis. So I can take any building and say, okay, if I hover, what happened in Marquee Mill Park? Well, we had this many admissions, this many readmissions. I can click on Marquee Mill Park, and I can even drill in. And I can see their results on a trending analysis. And I can click further, and we can get down to the patient level, and we can find out what kind of medications were they on, and who authorized the readmission, and what time of day did it happen, and what were the contributing factors. We can even do this for hospitals. I love doing these kind of meetings. We meet with, I just had a meeting with the Adams Medical Center a few weeks ago and meet with them next week. And they want to pull the data in and they want to say, okay, we sent you 72 patients in the last month. What happened to them? How many went home? How many went to an assisted living? How did they fare? What was the length of stay? How much money did it cost? And all of that stuff we can now do using the live data. We can even give them the names of the doctors that are readmitting the patients. I love, this is my favorite chart, because if I get a big enough room of physicians, invariably there will be somebody on this report, and you'll see somebody go, Bob, what's the deal? Because <laughs> you know, nobody tracks this. They don't even know this. Hospitals have no clue. Who's, who's the guy they called at 2 in the morning and authorized the readmission? And this is one of my favorites. So using that claims data, I can see how well are my buildings doing compared to all the competitors in the market. I can see that CMS was expecting me to be at a 19% readmission rate based on my acuity level, and I came in under expectations, which is great. My competitors may be struggling with these markets. And this is actual data that came from Q2 2015. All right, so that particular market where we went in and they cut the length of stay and they caused all that angst, we were able to go back a year later, and I'm gonna give you an example of one of the reports we did. I went back to that convener and I said, okay, here are all of your patients, let's just say they're all hip replacement, okay? 
you'll notice that the volume of patients that leave on day one is very low. Day two, a few more patients leave. You get out to day 20 and you see a spike, and that's when the copay kicks in. So that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> You're able to overlay the data now with functional improvement scores. So I see that on day two, day three, day four, not a lot of improvement for the population, but the further out I get, the more this diagnosis starts to stabilize. Make sense? You can then bring in the readmission statistics. And so I can see that if a patient left on the first three or four days of their stay, readmission rates are through the roof. But the longer they stay, the more they drop out, and eventually they zero out. And what's great about this is I was able to say, okay, the last time we met, you told us this diagnosis should be here, and all this stuff happened. This is where it should be. So we're able to cross-correlate and help educate our partners who don't have access to the data. And all that's possible because of the relationship that we have with you guys. So this is the future, and we'll wrap up with this last slide. It's interesting, I've been doing a lot of presentations for skilled nursing facilities to hospitals, and invariably the hospital CTO will come to me and say, hey, can you put that live data into any nursing home? And I go, yeah. And so we're starting to see each of the skilled nursing facilities in certain markets using different softwares to you know, do their documentation, do their clinical work, and we're able to roll that into the atmosphere environment and give the hospitals visibility into everything that's going on. So our client base has grown and changed rapidly in the last 18 months. So it's been a very exciting journey. And again, a lot of it because of you guys. Mm -hmm. Questions for him? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you've obviously, all this great work that you've done, you would assume you would be getting more clients. But does it also mean that you've changed your economic model with those clients? Because you're obviously providing a great deal of, of very valuable data that's a great question so to get to the business decision we made early on we did it for the marquee group they incurred most of the expense it cost about 1.4 million to set the whole thing up and I had hair when I started it was <laughs> <laughs> but because it was already paid for and because we wanted to help our consonus clients uh, gain market share across the country and to your point we wanted to create stickiness with our client base we virtually give this away it's a dollar per skilled patient day. So if you go into a nursing home, you'll have a lot of patients there, but maybe only 10 of them are actually participating in therapy, but we call it skilled patients. So let's say you have 15 skilled, it's $450 a month. So it fluctuates depending on patient volume. And we made that decision because we wanted to make the price very digestible. And to your point, we also have been able to grow both the pharmacy and rehab divisions pretty dramatically. Yeah, it's we've had a pretty a massive increase in client base. Yes, sir. Can you localize the information that you would give to your clients? Uh, Basically, if you want a specific area of... Yeah. I, I can take the CMS claims data. Is that what you're referencing? Yes. Yeah, I can look at any market in the United States. In fact, one of the new client bases that have come up is the insurance industry and the REITs because they're lending money to these to long-term care facilities and or they're insuring them and they want to be able to assess the risk of the insurance. So they come to us and say, hey, yes, we want to see the 19 nursing homes in you know, Tennessee and, or in Nashville, and we want to know how they're doing compared to one another. And so we do reporting like that all the time. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, at what point does this data claim be provided to consumers to help That is actually on the. I have a I have a wall in my office that you can write on, and that's probably number thirteen on my list because there are a few resources. And I was just talking with your your uh, advertising firm here. Um, there are about thirteen or about thirteen groups out there that I know of that can uh, do that type of work. Places like uh, Nursing Home Compare, or a Place for Mom. It's all old data. If I get a big enough client base using the live data, then I can do analytics and, and I can offer that up as well. Yes. Is post care feedback from the patient part of the data set that you analyze? It is, yes. Okay. Yeah. From from the patient themselves? Yes. Okay. And if the patient's not able to participate in the survey, we go to the family member and get a survey response from them as well. We have about 17 questions we look at. There are uh, CAPS questions, and if you guys are, there's a standard set of questions that CMS has put in place for home health and hospice. They have yet to adopt that for skilled nursing, but it's likely going to happen, and I already have a friend on the committee, so I know what questions to ask. So. Mr. Baker, I have a question for you. No, no, no. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> and, and full disclosure, uh, I, I, I did not prepare him for this because that would have been too easy. Um, 
Uh, since you have an incredibly skilled IT department that you've run for a long time, it, truly, uh, really, I mean, I, I, I know that you're in charge and that's weird, but, but, but you're- They call me old, the long time, it's a really, really long time. <laughs> <laughs> a long time, and your team's great. Again, uh -huh. your, your title's amazing, but um, I, I wonder, can you speak just quickly to what it was like for you to make the decision to, to work with a whole other technical team and kind of collaboratively move forward with a totally different environment that's now, you know, cross-connected literally and metaphorically. Like, can you can you just walk quickly through for these folks what the, what that decision was like and how it's working? Yeah, for the um, so if you remember back in Anthony's slide, there's this box called data warehouse, right? And and there was a time when it was just our house's information in there, right? It was just the marquee data, and I'm like, ah, eh, we feel pretty good about that. And so Anthony comes, he's like, you know what I want to do? I want to go beyond that. I want to start collecting data for everybody across the country. And I'm like, so we've got to be good stewards of everybody's data. And then he brings me articles like, hey, did you see that the CTO or uh, CIO was personally sued because he wasn't managing his data? I'm like, you're not helping me feel good about this, right? So it's like, so, but here's more data. Just don't screw it up, Baker. I'm like, that's fantastic. So. Um, so that got me even more nervous. And so we we were we had a relationship with um, gosh it was Easy Street back in the day, um, with that Macera, and uh, we said okay well you know we want to want to talk about what kind of security um, practices you can help us with. And we were really just looking at the infrastructure piece of it. Um, and then we sat down at a table and Leslie came in and a team of engineers everything from storage to networking uh, to I mean everything. Uh, came in and, and we went through over and over again and it was a team that would have cost me a fortune to bring together you know if I was to bring this in house it just wasn't wasn't feasible in any practical level uh, and so we brought in our DBAs my network engineer uh, myself and Anthony and we just went through and just went through a lot of design iterations and at one point in time I I, I had to believe we were the highest maintenance customer they could have ever have had because it took us then she keeps saying no, but I'm like, I'm pretty sure we were close. So after after many, many months and many iterations of design, uh, we came together with a gold standard and it's been absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And I think I think what it really was is they understood our business objectives, right? Anthony really laid down what we we're trying to get done and the team at Atmosphere did a really good job of understanding where we were going and really helped us value engineer a, a platform that would allow us to get done what we needed to get done today and also talk to the hospitals, right? When you go and talk to a hospital uh, CIO, it's a whole different conversation. Uh, and we've got a customer down in Medford who, you know, they come out of <laughs> they come out of government contract in Boeing, and so we had had to fly Leslie down there to meet with this person just to help give them some sense of uh, reassurance that that we were doing the right thing, and it it was nailed. So. Um, it feels like they are just an extension of my department, and um, we have very, very few partners that, that I can say that about. So it's been really good, really good with that, Ms. Sarah. This comment, I came from the health plan world. You get all the enrollment meetings, and you did, actually, I did the first enrollment meeting for, um, for Easy Street back in the day. Wow. We all want a healthy young male. We want to enroll those, those are the best risks. The greatest challenge in our world today is when we talk about health care, we forget about the biggest issue facing us. We've all buried parents, family, and the last years of our lives are spent in those facilities. Yep. The greatest challenge we have is controlling and managing those costs and doing it in a, in a human way. Right. So, good job. I, I, it's the greatest challenge we have, and we're not talking about it. I totally agree. You know what's funny is, uh, John and I were having a conversation about some of the data we're looking at that's national now, and we were commenting on how there are markets in the U.S. where utilization is through the roof. You know, a senior will spend 70, 80 days in a facility, and we kind of go, what? And to your point, we realized four years ago that the days of doing the work and getting paid for the work you do is going away. And we as an organization have been pushing our partners and our own buildings to shorten the length of stay to the appropriate point. So we started this and we actually implement it now. If you go to a marquee building and you look at the average length of stay compared to other facilities, it is far less. But the patients stay home, they're stable. We take the time to understand if grandma's got to navigate a gravel driveway and we account for that in the therapy and care plan. And we have a very comprehensive approach to this. And I agree wholeheartedly. We've got to find a way to reduce the cost. And we're, to your point, we're really investing heavily, right? Because nobody wants to be 
right? Let's call it is in an institutional facility. You don't have to go. You'd rather be at home. And so we're investing heavily in how do we bring using technology care to the resident's home, right? That's where we want to be. So that's where the family wants them to be. That's where they want to be. And if we can, you know, monitor 24/7 and collect that information, if we can take action, you know, when we see an event occur, uh, and we've got a mobilized nursing force, then you know, it's a win all the way around. I think. So. It was all us. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I just want to close, I, I think, with where I, I started by saying our, our clients continue to make us better at what we do. Our roadmap for 17, uh, we will be uh, partnering with several health organizations that will get us uh, high trust certified for the first time. So raising the bar for many of our uh, healthcare organization clients who are going to want to hit frankly, a much higher mark than HIPAA high tech. Um, but it's time, um, it's a much higher standard, it's much more like PCI DSS, certainly moving towards 3.2. Um, so we will have that under our belt by the end of the year, which is a terrific achievement. Um, as most of you probably know, we do an enormous amount of work uh, with Azure and in Azure. They are also um, providing us the opportunity of hybrid modeling with high trust, so that's gonna be a great target for us as well, uh, moving down that path, which is very exciting. Uh, we are also going to partner on 10, IRS 1075 audit uh, this year coming up in 17. Uh, that will be a huge achievement for us, raise the bar yet higher in terms of our info security practice and our compliance practices. Um, so a lot of really good stuff coming for us. Again, these are being driven by the clients that are coming to us. Um, they are improving their own practices and uh, helping us get better all the time. So very exciting year ahead and, and much gratitude. So. Thank you all so much for being here.